Well, welcome to Tech 5173, Global Technology. And we are arriving at the end of the semester, the day that we have been waiting for. And I want you, please, if you know what you see here, don't talk. If you know what you see, wave at me. If you know it, I've used it before. So don't talk. If you don't know it, wave at me. <coughs> Very good. What do you think this could be? Oh, you know it. Very good. You are very smart. <laughs> this is your day. Shine. So I'm going to say this is your day, and you say shine. This is your day. Shine. Big one. This is your day. Shine. No. This is your day. Shine. Now, when I say it again, I want you, when you say shine, to jump up like a spring. You know what the spring? Not the spring, the water, but the spring that does like this. So, one, two, three. This is your day. No, we have to go like an army. This is your day? Shine. Very good. I like that. I like that. Sit down again. We will do it one more time for the camera. And this will stay for 50 million years on YouTube. So you want to really spring like Janice did. Do you see her? Now, this is your day? Shine. Very good. Have a seat. We will stop. I'm uh, David Conwell, and I'll be s also speaking about the barriers of thought identification technology. Hi, my name is Vijay Krishna. I'm, I'm going to speak about the implications in this technology. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm going to start the presentation. Like uh, Our topic is thought identification, and I'm going to present you about the past technology which was used in this thought identification process. Uh, uh, the past technology that has been used is the polygraph. Uh, the polygraph is nothing but uh, it can be referred as a lie detector. Uh, we have seen many scenarios where uh, people use this lie detector to uh, find out the tr truth and everything. Basically, this works uh, when, uh, when the people record their physical actions of a human being, like uh, the blood pressure, the uh, respiration, uh, the uh, flow of uh, uh, the skin, and everything uh, that is uh, related to a human in order to capture all the reactions and to detect whether he is speaking truth or uh, he is lying on some issue or something. Uh, the basic uh, idea of this polygraph is that uh, when you test a person, first uh, the person who is testing the person uh, will ask him about two to three questions simultaneously so that he'll record every uh, pulse and every uh, activity the person's, uh, like uh, the body is undergoing and he'll record it through a graph. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, we have the monitor and the graph is uh, presented there. After th uh, the recording is done, uh, based on those questions, he'll analyze if he's telling the truth or no. Why? Because if the blood pressure is up and down, or if he hesitates in something, uh, it might be detected as a lie. Uh, after collaborating the genuine questions he has asked, it then only it can be recorded. Uh, in this, there is a defect like it the person who has a fear symptom, uh, if he's tr telling the truth or false, he might be in a fear and uh, that recording cannot be captured correctly because, uh, because of the fluctuations in his uh, 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 like blood pressure or the skin and everything. So sometimes uh, it might be a failure. So there are many advanced technologies which have been implem implemented uh, by reducing this uh, effect in this polygraph. Uh, like most of the scientists in the past technologies claim only 60 percentage of it is as true, uh, whereas uh, other percentage, like uh, person with uh, fear symptoms and all, uh, the information gathered is not correctly. So uh, the further technologies will be explained by. Uh yeah, hello, everyone. Um, I'll be talking about current technology. 
Yeah, basically, the current technologies involved in this thought identification process, uh, we have two classifications, uh, the invasive and the non-invasive. The invasive typically talks about a process that implants sensors into the brain, and that requires that a surgical operation be uh, done on the subjects who is to undergo uh, the thought identification process. But for our research, we would not be focusing on the invasive because uh, once a surgical operation is done and you have the sensor implanted in the brain, it means that there are, there are several limitations because uh, it, it has been said that if one is thinking about a particular object, you know, your experience of that particular object differs from my own experience of that particular object. Probably, you know, I might have an ham uh, a hammer with me, you know, in which I used to nail something, and somebody might have a bad experience with that hammer. So if we do, do the invasive technology, it's going to be at a disadvantage because once it's implanted in a particular part of the brain, we can't change it to the other one. If we have to do that, that person has to go through another surgical operation again, and that could be uh, quite damaging. So we'll concentrate on the non-invasive, which uh, typically measures brain activity with you know, external sex, uh, sensors. You, you can see that picture there having like several you know, electronics and stuff like that, you know, uh, on the scalp of that particular person. So basically, uh, we'll just talk about two uh, widely used uh, non-invasive current technology. That's the functional magnetic resonance imaging, the FMRI, and the EEG, the electroencephalography. The FMRR actually maps a brain pattern that corresponds to families of words. So now what scientists, what researchers have been able to do is that for us to actually know what is going through your mind, you go through the MRI scanner and stuff like that, and you are presented, before you go in, you are presented with several uh, kinds of objects, words, and stuff like that. And at the end of it, the, it, it helps in actually putting together, categorizing the, the different kind of objects that you must have seen. For example, maybe someone who is uh, seeing a table, chair, and stuff like that. He put it in the category of furniture. So the person does not necessarily have to see everything that relates to furniture. Probably, you know, you've only seen table for the whole lifespan of your life. And if you are presented with something else other than table, it will be able to uh, detect that, okay, this is what this person is actually thinking because it can actually categorize it uh, under different categories. Also, uh, under the FMRI, we have this uh, dispatcher pattern that actually help in, you know, detecting what your responses could be. Even before you give the answer, probably someone is asking you a question, you know, and even before you verbalize it out, it helps to actually help us know what you're thinking prior to the answer that you are uh, you giving, and also we could know if you're actually lying or not. Then uh, also, scientists actually use uh, what we call the Bayesian model to be able to read the thoughts of human beings. The, the Bayesian model actually have two uh, forms: the formal model and the uh, a priori. Uh, model. The formal model actually talks about, you know, the, the images that are formed, for example, when you are looking at, as I'm looking at everyone, there are some kind of images that have been formed in my brain such that even if I've not seen, like, okay, let me put it this way. We have some Indians here. We have Americans. We have probably Arabs and stuff like that. So if, if I walk out of this class, probably there's a flash of these people on my face, then I walk out of this class. If I see a group of people, like multitude of people, I will be able to categorize, okay, which people among these people are Indians, probably because of the few seconds of flashes of Indian people that I've seen, and probably Americans and other uh, nationals there. Then the last one I'll be talking about is the the EEG, 
which uses the electrodes placed directly on the scalp to measure the brain activity. And uh, the recent research, I think that was 2013, last year, uh, they were able to actually uh, develop a brain-controlled wheelchair in which someone with a disability could move that wheelchair with a thought pattern that is going on in his mind. If he sits on the wheelchair and he wants the wheelchair to go right, he could actually just have a thought of it in his mind. He doesn't have to say it out. He doesn't have to press any button. All he has to think is, I will go left in, my, in, in his mind. Then the wheelchair goes left. If he wants to go forward, backward, and stops like that, then uh, David will be talking about the barriers to this technology. Thank you. Hi, I'll be talking about the barriers, basically, from what was polygraph, MRI, and then what will stop us from basically becoming science fiction. Um, I'll start with actually just the, the barriers for each individual type, the intrusive, the MR, fMRI, and the EEG. Uh, for the intrusive barriers, you have to think, in what language does the brain really speak? Does it speak in Java? Does it speak in uh, C++? Do you treat it like a computer? It is your organic computer. So how do you interface with something that you don't know the language of. I think everybody's had a problem with Mac and PC and trying to get files for one to the other. Now imagine if one's just completely different. Imagine one's just a pile of goo, basically. Now how do you hook up your USB drive to that? The second one is actually a little more philosophical, the fMRI. Each brain is a sum of its individual interactions, events, uh, experiences. So like Akunwe uh, said earlier about people's interactions with uh, a hammer. Let's say uh, a, a chef's memory of a knife or their initial response, their perception, would be far different than someone who had recently been attacked by, by a knife. So while one might be a professional, one might be a traumatic experience. Or the, the situation, let's say, uh, an urban dweller who doesn't own a car, basically takes the subway everywhere, will have a completely different interaction with a car than someone who uses one on a day-to-day -day commute. So if you have to actually tailor each individual thought process or thought reading to one particular person, then it doesn't really make as much sense. Here's a pretty good uh, indicator. So it basically breaks up, let's say you view an item like celery, it breaks it up into a couple of different uh, indicators. So you see the section there, it says eat, taste, fill, well, the difference between, you might be able to tell the difference between if somebody likes celery or doesn't like celery, but you probably can't tell why they don't like celery. Maybe they had food poisoning when they ate a lot of celery. Maybe they, who knows? Maybe they're allergic to it. But you wouldn't be able to tell that really without almost an autobiographical interview with them. But if you're trying to read their thoughts, why not just take the autobiographical interview? So basically, they'd need to be calibrated. So this would take hours and days, maybe even weeks, inside an fMRI, asking them comprehensive questions about how do you feel about celery? Why don't you feel this way about celery? And on and on and on. And if you know anything about these fMRIs, they cost over a million dollars, and they take up a whole heck of a lot of energy. So then on to the EEG. This is just that uh, skull cap that we saw earlier. Uh, the problem with that is it's a high signal to noise ratio. You can kind of get it to go forward, backward, really not that much other than that. You can kind of detect which way it wants to go, but really not as much. Uh, it's pretty similar with the intrusive, but with less accuracy because you can't pinpoint and uh, really reduce that noise. And then on here to the implications. Hi. Um, the implications, implications of this technology. Um, in Japan, the research have been made a gadget that allows to take the direct pictures into the screens, direct pictures from the brain. Uh, and, and also, we are uh, before we're talking about FM fMRI and EEG, we have a lot of connections are required to read a mind. The, they are planning to make a gadget with a single connection with the brain to read the images, images of the brain. And some of the advantage advantages through this technology. Recording the thoughts process through a single chip 
set instead of uh, polygraph, fMRI, and EEG. Uh, to we can we can use this technology because we have uh, before we using FM, fMRI fMRI and EEGs we we require a lot of connections to read the brain brain activities but they are going to implement the implementing plan they are planning to implement a single connection device to read the images of the brain and one more advantage is possibly it is uh, very easy to identify the theft before it going to be committed if you have access to read the brains of the criminals and a group of japanese effectively shown that uh, straightforward pictures delivered from the brain brain to the computer screen they are not the signals they are pi pictures pictures of the what they are thinking and uh, some of the cons and what are the by using this technology we have some defects also loss of privacy every every individual wants to keep some of the information in their brain some of the important in information if you if you have anyone have access to their brain it is they may lose their privacy like uh, if you have a if someone have someone have someone have Anything else? Anything else? Any questions? Any questions for a group? The first group. Any questions? Loss of privacy. Your thoughts. Penny for your thought. Any questions? I have a question. Quick question. Did you read anything about uh, uh, when do you think this will happen? We saw a video five years ago, and they updated it last year. Didn't say much. Where do they stand now? You read anything about where they are? Unfortunately, a lot of the organizations that are doing research on this are tend to be fairly secretive or government organizations. So, uh, oftentimes, research won't be publishable or openly available. Uh, there are companies saying that they can do targeted marketing and read whether someone will like this or that, but I don't think the science is quite there yet. I think they they've made some. Some uh, improvements, but I don't think it's it's the level that it should be or that, that it could be. I have another question. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I I also think research is still ongoing uh, in this uh, field, and uh, some researchers are kind of confident that probably uh, within the next three or five years uh, we should have something uh, much more better, you know, in accuracy, you know, something that is more sophisticated than what we have now, but. It's still a whole lot of work, so let's hope that it, it does actually work. Another question. Uh, yes. What What's the possibility? So of of like perfecting the technology to a point where you can. So you talked about reading someone's thoughts. What about actually forcing thoughts onto the subject? Is did anyone come across anything speculating about that? Um, the only information I saw is basically the brain is very, very good at taking input, even if they're artificial sensors. Um, whether you can actually authentically put that memory or that feeling, that emotion into somebody, they really don't know. Um, I think they're more interested in trying to get something out first, and then they'd have to think about it. But nothing in particular, no. One more question, if I may. A sign language in every language is different, I guess, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So Chinese sign language is different than Arabic than English, I guess. I don't know. How, how about, uh, I mean, uh, heart in English has uh, another word in Arabic, another word in Indian, another uh, in Chinese, and so forth. How do they have the same MRI talking about the heart, for example? Do they have the same part of the brain or? 
Yeah, I I think uh, when you think about the a word, probably it doesn't matter which uh, what language. I think is the image you know that matters. If I think of heart in my own local dialect, I have a mental picture of what uh, a heart looks like. If you're thinking about it in your uh, language as well, you have the mental picture you know of what that is. So, okay, let's give them a hand, please. Okay. Can we stop the taping for a second, please? Okay, hello everybody. My name is uh, Abdullah Lomar, and then today we're gonna talk about the artificial il intelligence. My name is Sarun. Today I would like to explain about uh, some of the important languages which are used in artificial intelligence. My name is Nagaraju, and I'm going to explain about the applications of artificial intelligence. And my name is Kaisha. I'm going to talk about the advantage and a disadvantage of the artificial intelligence. So basically today we're going to talk about these topics and then I will talk about the concept which is overall applications, languages, <coughs> and then artificial intelligence as a whole. First of all, what's the artifi artificial intelligence? And then it's, it's a claiming to be able to re recreate the capability of human mind is both a challenges and inspiration of for philosophy. So basically I found the definition is it's about like it's the science and engineering of making intelligence machines, especially intelligent computer program. So pretty much as a human being we like to have like uh, a machines that act like us, help us doing some some of the work. So I would it would be like helpful for a human being to have a better life. So, first of all, what is, what is the artificial intelligence? It's the capacity to learn and solve problems. So, artificial intelligence is the intelligence of machines and reports and, and the branch of computers. Science that aims to create, to create it. So, there is like some of the benefits from having, uh, having it, the ability to solve problems, so in some of the uh, some of the hospitals, or like you, you can have the reports to do the to this uh, to do the surgery, and then the ability to act rationally, and then the ability to act like human beings. So ba basically, I'll talk about the history of the artificial intelligence. It's a start from 1940, and then uh, from 1943 to 1956, uh, the Mac and Pitts start to investigate in the in artificial intelligence and then Dartmouth meeting it's called artificial intelligence named adopted and then the golden year which people like start focusing on it it was in 1956 to 1974 in 1986 uh, rise of machine of machine learning natural networks return in, uh, in popularity major advance in machine learning uh, and applications in 1995, artificial intelligence as a science, integration of learning reasons and no knowledge res uh, is representation, artificial intelligence methods used in vision, language, data, and meaning, etc. Yeah, until now, my friend explained about the definition and history of uh, artificial intelligence. So now I would like to explain some of the important languages which are using artificial intelligence. So here the artificial intelligence researchers have developed several specialized programming languages for artificial intelligence, which includes IPL, which stands for, which stands as information processing language, uh, and LISP, which is the list programming language, and Prolog, which is the general purpose logical programming language. So in, in this artificial intelligence, the most important languages are the <coughs> LISP and Prolog. So I would like to uh, discuss about this. Now this is the introduction of the Lisp. Uh, Lisp is a family of a computer programming language with a long history and a distinctive, fully pan parenterized policy prefix notation. Originally, this specify, uh, Lisp is specified in the year 1958. Then after, uh, it is the second oldest high-level programming language, which we know, which we know, and the first one is Fortran, and this is the second one, and the Today, the most widely known general purpose Lisp uh, dialect is or like common Lisp and scheme, 
those are both are the important dialects of the LISP. And LISP is used as a practical mathematical notation for computer programs. This language is generally used for the formation of the mathematical programming in, a, in an any considerations. Actually, this Lisp is derived from the Lisp pro processing. Uh, Linked list is one of the Lisp language. Here, the linked list includes the data source and data structures. Uh, they manipulate, the programmers will manipulate the data structures into the data source here. So by that, they can, they can get the macro systems. Then those macro systems are, are, used, by, are used by the programmers to develop a new, new vision language. So I would like to explain like Lisp is a connection to AI, that is artificial intelligence. It is an important language for artificial intelligence programming. These are mainly used for expressing the, performing the algorithms to an expression. So generally these languages are used in the artificial intelligence to in the, in the form of robots or like any remote sensing devices. So actually these, uh, the main purpose of the Lisp programs are to develop an expressions with the help of algorithms. And here frames, networks, and objects are the responsible for Lisp popularity in the AI community. So by using language, this, this kind of language, we can set many frames and networks and objects oriented within our flexibility. And Lisp is widely used in implementing the tools of artificial intelligence. Here the, the Lisp tools are like neural networks, networks, control theory, and languages, logic, and the search and optimization. Now I, I would like to discuss about the Prolog, which is the other important language which is used in artificial intelligence. Prolog is a general purpose logic program language, as I said before, which is associated with the artificial intelligence and com computational linguists. And this, this language has its roots in first order and formal logic, which means uh, it generally takes the declarations in terms of many rules and uh, regulations, which are like uh, with these kind of things like question mark, accelerometry, or hyphen, those things. In Prolog, programming log logic is expressed in terms of relations, as I said, and a computation is initiated by running a query. So these queries are mainly run by the syntaxics and uh, semantics, which are, which are uh, the, the following are the considered under them. Those are like data types, rules and facts, evaluation, loops, and neg negations. So by using all these things in the languages, in the language, we can design our own algorithm, which are represented as the logical algorithms. Now I would like to discuss about the comparison between the LISP and Prolog. Here, LISP is a general function language. Uh, function language in the sense, the people who generally use, the programmers generally use this by to, to express a mathematical expression. And this one is a logic language. And the LISP is a general purpose, used for general, general purpose. And the Prolog is used for mainly for specific users. And LISP handles wide variety of tasks easier to use. But this Prolog smaller, is a smaller language, easier to learn, actually. And LISP does not support compared to Prolog and used for single directional reasoning, whereas Pro Prolog can be supports for multi-directional reasoning. And this one is a parent, the diagram represents the parental disciplines of AI. Uh, here it includes the subjects covered under AI and, and also application areas of AI. Under subjects concerned, uh, the advantage includes reasoning, learning, planning, perception, and et cetera. Uh, whereas uh, coming to parental disciplines of AI, it includes philosophy and philosophy, mathematics, psychology, and computer science. Now, that's, uh, the important applications of AI will be discussed by my friend, Nagraj. The applications of artificial intelligence is mainly like natural language understanding and expert systems, planning and robotics, machine learning, and game playing. Uh, we use artificial intelligence in mainly games and robotics. Natural language processing to design and build software that will analyze, understand, and generate languages that humans use naturally. Uh, like when we want to communicate with others, or we need to understand the language between two people. How we communicate, modes of communication, text-based communications or dialogue-based communications. Uh, for the text-based communications, we use uh, 
Yahoo, Gmail, and charts, and everything. For the dialogue-based communications, uh, when we want to speak with the uh, speak with uh, anyone, we use like uh, earphones and everything. Speech recognition process of converting sound signal captured by microphone or mobile telephone to to set of words, like 7,200 words. Uh, with minimum accuracy of 90 percentage. Computer vision. Ability of a machine to extract information from an image that is necessary to solve a ta task, like image acquisition, like obtaining the image completely by framing it to completely from one to one part, and processing image and analyzing the image and understanding the image completely. <laughs> Expert systems. Uh, expert systems means like computers. Uh, we use these are softwares used for decision making and automated reasoning and theorem proving. Troubleshooting expert systems and stock market expert system. Robotics tend to mimic human sensing and decision making abilities so that they can adapt themselves to certain conditions and modify their actions. I have a small video on this one. Would you like to show me? Okay. And the rest of the thing. So I'm going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence, the need of over. Many thousand, many thousands of artificial intelligence ap applications are deeply embedded in the in infrastructure of every industry. Like uh, if you go to the digital lab and there's a couple of 3D cutting machines, and basically those machines are trying to recognize the G code, which was designed by by students. And according to those codes, they just make the the parts which was designed. And field, um, fields of uh, fields of AL is, is one of them is computer science. Graphical user interface, o automatic storage management, object oriented programming, and telecommunication. And another one is Aviation and autom automation, and it also in robotic field. Assembling robot ro robots and the welding robots. Basically, a uh, welding robots is type of robots which used for passing two metals and those kind of condition is very hazard for the hu hu for the human being to 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 make it. So we basically just use the robot to replace human. And there's several other robots. And I don't know if you guys uh, know, watch the Big Hero, the the movie. And in that movie, there's a robot for for he heroes and medical purpose. Basically, that much that that robot ro robot is like uh, scanning someone's body and uh, give some suggestion of health. And how is an um, artificial intelligence is different from the natural intelligence, and for the artificial intelligence, they cannot create. They are not creative, but like the like the cutting machine, uh, it cut exactly how long is that piece, and it's also consistency and the multitasking can do several things at the same time. 
but those things human cannot do. And but the good thing is human are creative, more creative than artificial intelligence. Like all of the design are made by human. And the drawbacks of artificial intelligence, limited, uh, um, limited ability, slow real-time response, can't handle emergency situation, difficult code, high cost. Basically, it, it means the artificial intelligence is not very relaxable because of the coding is, is there. Uh, the, the robot basically, they act according to the co codes. So they can just do what the codes ask them to do. Okay, that's it, thank you. Any questions to start with? What is this all talk about in near 2045? The robots and the computers will be much powerful than a human being's mind. Have you heard about that? Do you read anything about that? Transhumanism, you remember that? Uh, we've seen that one in class explained by one of the Professor, he explained about transhumanism and the singularity. In 2045, uh, maybe robots can lead the world. So really, the uh, non-creativity of the human, uh, of the artificial intelligence will be overcome, you think? Because you give it many probabilities, many possibilities, and the artificial intelligence will choose this or that. So do you think it will be creative or no? I think it takes like around three decades of time to implement. It this takes kind of what? Three decades, like three 30 decades. years. Yes. So, so they will arrive at it? Yes. So I think so. That's what you think? Yes. So meet me at 5.30 after three decades. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> and let's see how it goes. Yeah. Any other questions? Would you please give them a hand? <laughs> India is ready. I'm Brandy. I'm uh, going to talk to you about the teaching of technology in ADHD. And I'm Chrislyn, and I'll be talking. I'll be doing the introduction to technology in ADHD. So ADHD stands for attention, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It affects millions of children. This is a chronic, chronic c condition. Uh, therefore, there is no cure, but medical researchers are looking to. Uh, to work with children to help subdue their symptoms. And with some children, this de uh, their symptoms decrease with age, but um, others will suffer fr from it their entire lives. So children or adults with ADHD, they have difficulty with activities that include paying attention, following instructions, <laughs> listening, or finishing tasks. And they can frequently daydream, interrupt conversation, lose important items, or fidget throughout class. When a child goes in to get diagnosed with ADHD, they'll first go through a med medical exam, therefore they can rule out any other factors that may be causing their symptoms. The doctor is going to want to gather information, and this can be uh, personal medical history, family medical history, and school records. From there, they can go um, to do interviews with coaches, teachers, family members, try and get more information on the child. Uh, then they'll go to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and the child has to score at least uh, six items in two different categories in order for them to be diagnosed with ADHD. And we have some audio for Jamie's part, but it's not. There are some common causes surrounding ADHD. Of these common causes, there's hereditary, explicit compulsive substances, brain trauma, food addicts. Sorry. There are some common causes surrounding ADHD. Of these common causes, there's hereditary, explicit compulsive substances, brain trauma, food addicts, bad parenting, and technology. This is 
is a cause or effect? I'm not sure, but it is alarming and interesting. Technology has been proven to increase dopamine levels or releases in our brain. When we're not using that technology, our dopamine levels drop, which causes boredom in a large percentage of people. According to Wikipedia, boredom is an emotional state experienced when an individual is left without anything in particular to do and not interested in their surroundings. Medicine to treat ADHD and technology both increase dopamine levels in the brain. So how could technology be the cause if it has been proven to do the same thing as the treatment? In my opinion, ADHD is just misunderstood. Technology only serves as a distraction, not a cause. And technology is a common resource that can be used in determining diagnosis for ADHD. Who said I was usually a distraction? Squirrels. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about um, the treat, like teaching how to teach a student that has ADHD, and this is actually very close to my heart because my stepson does have ADHD, so I work with him a lot on this. Um, my slides are full of a lot of information, but I'm actually going to just talk to you about them because, I mean, if any of you need to know more about it. Um, Direct instruction, uh, students who have ADHD, they really need for people to be clear and concise and tell instructions frequently. They can't just, you can't just sit there and, you know, tell them like we would here in class. You have, they have to hear it several times for them to understand because their ability to pay attention is so minimal sometimes that they, they don't even hear what you're saying. Um, auditory cues and visual cues are good things to have. Um, so like, for instance, like for my son, we have um, a timer that goes off ev every 30 minutes or so, and it reminds him that he needs to do something else. It's, all, it's all it is, is a reminder. Um, peer tutoring, it is good for when they're in the classroom environment is to have like the other kids understand what's happening so that they can help uh, encourage the student to stay on track. And it's really, I found with my son, that it was more, uh, it was not helpful for him to be sitting by somebody else who was having a hard time paying attention in class. And some of those kids that are more the bad kids, not the kids that have ADHD, tended to push him towards a bad area. So we, ta after talking to the teacher, we learned that um, if we set him with somebody who likes to study, he's gonna pay attention to what that kid's doing. So that helps with us a lot. Um, Instructions, multi-step instructions are very difficult for kids who have ADHD. Um, my son, we have to, we have a specific way we learn our spelling words. Uh, we start with, um, we put him in a, like a, a quieter area, like at the kitchen table, and he writes down in the words five times a piece. Once he writes down the words five times a piece, then he recites them to me and tells me what the words are. And then we go to the next step, which is, you know, I ask him the word, and he repeat. He tells me how to spell it, and then we go to the third step, which is where I spell the word, and he tells me what the word is. Um, we have been doing this this way this whole entire year. He got held back in the in kindergarten because he was having such a hard time with spelling that they thought he was going to be in the special ed class. How old? He is right now. He's eight. Um, scheduling. I, I have found that if you keep the kids on the schedule, it really helps to keep them on track. And it, with us, we have them every other day, and then we have them ever, every other weekend. So when we try not to deviate from that because there, it's a set schedule at his mom's house and a set schedule at our house for this reason. Um, this is him when he was seven. It's a good idea to keep them active. If you are sitting there and you're, and he's just like messing around constantly, it's good to get him up and do something. Um, I found that spending too much time on his iPad or um, 
playing video games, it really isn't that it's bad for him. It's just that he's sitting idle for so long. And then as soon as he's done, he's like, oh my gosh, I'm hyper and I need more help. So we have a certain amount of time that he's allowed to do uh, technology. TV, that includes TV, video games, everything. He gets uh, about 45 minutes at night. Then afterwards, we have to have him sit down and uh, read a book. This helps like calm him down and bring his levels down. And we go to bed at 8 o'clock specifically so that he cannot, because uh, he'll go to bed at 8 o'clock, but won't fall asleep till 8.30 or 8.45 because his brain just keeps going. Um, being able to reward him, what we have started this uh, year is great because we have, um, once he had a month of 100% on his spelling test, we had a cake and a party. And then we did a three month of 100% on the pretest, to where he doesn't have to take it on Friday. Uh, and we went to go skating. And now we're waiting for the six month mark. If he gets six months of not uh, missing or missing any on his spelling words, then we're going to go to Chicago to the science and industry because he loves the science and industry. Um, the idea is to give them like small term goals and rewards to help them want to do it. Um, this is what we've seen in first grade. We found that you know the teacher would have a long lecture and she wouldn't have anything to do with them. And then she wanted him to actually know what she was talking about. And <coughs> he was off daydreaming about Legos and well, what we was going to do when we got home and all that good stuff. So we had to talk to the teacher about you know focusing in on him. When I talk to him, I specifically have to tell him sometimes, you know, look me in the eye. So let me see what you're doing. Because if you don't keep focusing on that and stay active with him, his eyes will just wander. And he, he doesn't pay any attention to you. Um, structure and organization. This is what I've been talking about. You know, you have to have the organization and structure to keep them on task. This helps with their memory. If you're saying it constantly, it's kind of like you and I, if I'm saying it constantly that you need to do this, then you're going to remember to do it. But if I just say it once, you, are you going to remember or are you not going to remember? Distractions. A lot of the places where I looked said that, you know, completely removing the distractions is what you need to do. And then there was a lot of that, of that said you should not remove all the distractions. I agree with not removing the distractions because if you put him in a room to study and there's no distractions whatsoever, when he goes to the classroom, there's going to be distractions no matter what. The idea is to take away those distractions like, like if you have an aquarium in the classroom and you set him right next to the aquarium, he's going to be staring at the fish all day long. So the idea is to, to keep him away from the aquarium. Um, this is him. Uh, they just did their Boy Scouts. He's very good at Boy Scouts because they do stuff step by step, and he just uh, did his boat. Um, I found that when he was, when he lost, he, he got third place, but when he lost that final race, his confidence went down a lot, and so we had to figure out, we have to figure out extra ways to boost his confidence back up. So we found that if we talked to him about his teamwork, or his ability to talk to other and uh, give them praise for their things, that helped him out. So he was so excited. So then he started shaking all the kids' hands and being like, oh, good job. And then he was motivated again. Um, a token economy is, like, is pretty much that. You're going to get a reward for doing something well. Like if I, we give out uh, quarters. So that way, at the end of the day, if he's done, had a good day, I give him a quarter. And he puts it in, and then at the end of the week, once he has enough quarters, he gets to go to the pinball game, or he gets to go to IGA money and get tattoos. I don't like tattoos, but I still let him do it. Not, I like tattoos, just not on <coughs> kids. So, um, Response costs, it's the pretty much the same thing as a token, but it helps control with impu or helps take care of impulsivity. Um, a lot of these kids, they, they can't help it. They're just going to get jumpy. Um, He's able to stay calm a lot of the time. He's on some medication that helps with this as well. Um, but timeouts, 
people think that timeout is because they think there's are bad kids, and they're not bad kids. The idea is that you only use a timeout when they're acting up. If you if they're acting up while they're doing their schoolwork, chances are he's not wanting to do his schoolwork. So he thinks, I'm not going to do it, so I'll just be bad. And then all the other kids are, you know, laughing or whatever, and that just, it's kind of like a reward for him <coughs> is to, so you're only supposed to use a timeout when, when they're being disruptive. Um, and then their attitude, if their attitude stays calm, then that's when you let them out of timeout. You don't, you don't, they say when your kids are little that you should go for every year that they're born, you should go for a minute in timeout. When they get to an older age, you should be able to go by their attitude and see if their attitude has changed by, be by being in the timeout. This is Hafsa's uh, slides from here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, medications, there are a lot of medications that are on here. And she did a lot of research about the different stimulant and non-stimulant drugs. There is Ritalin, which is what my son is on. I hate this drug. I think this drug is a terrible, terrible drug. Um, but it makes him sleepy. It, it makes him just kind of lose that energy. And when, like if you have him um, during the summer, because he doesn't have to take it in the summer, if he takes it off the summer, he's so full of life. And then as soon as he starts taking the medicine, he, he gets bound up. Uh, um, he can't go to the bathroom. His appetite is a lot, and he's really, you guys saw him, he's a really little guy. <laughs> he doesn't even weigh 35 <laughs> pounds and he's eight, but um, he, you know, just has lots and lots of issues. He can't sleep or he sleeps too much. Um, these are some of the non-stimulant medications. He hasn't been put on Wellbutrin yet, but it has been something that they talked about, but I don't agree with adding another medication to what he's already dealing with. Um, I already talked about that. Jitteriness is one of those things. He does not like to be jittery. It's, it, that's like his major thing is he, he doesn't like to be like this. Um, okay. So the next part is that ADHD treatment uh, should combine combine conventional treatment techniques such as medication, so the stimulant drugs or non-stimulant drugs, along with behavioral therapy uh, to help the student, especially those children that are going to have side effects along with it too, to try and see what we can do with behavioral therapy. One thing that was mentioned was using video games or computer games in order to help them focus that energy, although you might think it will do the opposite. Some of these video games and computer games, they have specific tasks and rewards after you complete the task. Therefore, they're Focusing in on following the directions, getting that done, getting the reward, just as uh, Brandy was talking about earlier about doing rewards throughout. So that's actually how technology can help them practicing those focusing techniques. And um, like I said, these are computers, tablets, smartphones. Um, I said video games. I There was one uh, study done with positive psychology done in adolescents that really helped them focus using video games. Uh, because it's something that's fun for them to do as well as can keep them engaged. When I was in student teaching, we tried to use the smart board as much as possible, um, getting the students not only just touching the technology because it's interesting, but it makes them get up out of their seat, come to the board, do something, then go back and sit down. So um, in my opinion, that's why I prefer that over, say, an iPad, because an iPad, then you're at your seat with the iPad instead of getting up and moving around. Okay. and. Um, so finally, technology can be a most important tool because it's exciting and interesting for children to use. That's for all children, not just with children who are suffering from ADHD, um, but it can also be an extra little bonus. Uh, so tablet or smart form applications can be used to develop certain social skills because sometimes these students, an, an extra condition they may suffer from is having trouble interacting with their peers because of the interruptions, the fidgetiness, um, not being able to pay attention. Sometimes they, can, sometimes they can struggle with that just a little bit more. Uh, do we have any questions? One question. Sorry, it's not the one. Um, when was ADHD first diagnosed? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, when was it first uh, recognized as a 
as as an issue as a, as a issue with children or people in general and treated i don't know the exact time frame i kn- i do know it was in the dsm3 um D- they, what, what dsm3 means um the s- book of psychology yeah we're now in we're now in the uh fifth we're now in dsm5 uh, when was your child diagnosed with that? Mine was diagnosed, in, uh, he's eight, so about two years ago. Uh, he They diagnosed him after he got held back in kindergarten. Why did you think that he has anything? Was he overactive, less active? Well, I think, I think that, <laughs> I think that my, he has only child syndrome. Um, I, he was also premature. Um, he's also the only was only the gr- only grandchild, and so I think a lot of it is, um, you know, a lot of people did stuff for him on a regular basis, and then he just did the video games. And since my husband and I have been together, you know, we've worked with him. He has calmed down quite a bit, and um, we we don't discourage using uh, technology because I love the smart board and all that stuff, but I do discourage when that's all they do. Um, there for a while that was about all he was doing, but he had so many different things ha- going on. I mean, he was premature. He was three pounds when he was born. So, yeah. well, <laughs> I have I have three co- more questions if you don't have. So if I give you the uh, as the niece, I was about early nineteen hundred. Do you want to answer the question, please? Oh, okay. Uh, th- there are some psychologists that they believe that there's no no such a disease like ADHD, and I have no idea. I just think that it's a it's a good idea to think to see it in an- another aspect. Aspect. It's like um, maybe, as you said, there are some reasons that makes you feel like this kid needs some helps, not drugs, other things. So, do you think it's true or not? Um, personally, I think he's a boy. He's an eight-year-old boy, and uh, if I remember all the eight-year-old boys, I mean, I'm a lot older than most of you, but I, if I think about all the eight-year-old boys when I was in school, they were all crazy yeah. dragons and <laughs> cowboys, <laughs> Indians, all that stuff. They were always running around. They were always doing stuff. So. Sometimes I think he's just an average eight-year-old l- little boy, but then when I watch him when he's learning, I and I read this stuff and I know more about this stuff, I I, I can see his his learning, but I, I'm not necessarily sure that it is ADHD. Yeah, I, I'm not really necessarily sure that yeah. it's true. So it's it's complicated. In that case. Sure. Uh, some of our research even said to. Be very cautious diagnosing a younger s- a child because younger children just naturally have a shorter attention span and they're naturally more active than, say, older children or adolescents or anything like that. So you need to be very careful that you're looking at um, the diagnostic uh, diagnostic and statistical man- manual of medical uh, mental disorders, if I could talk, um, to make sure you're looking at that to see if you're actually diagnosing them correctly and look at the family history and the medical history and everything like that, that you're not just making a rash decision. And I would suggest that I would think it'd be better to try some behavioral methods first and see if maybe just changing something in the classroom might help before jumping um, to prescription drugs or something like that. I know, like I said, when I was student teaching, there was a few students that um, the teacher said, well, they should probably get on medication or something like that. It's like, well, can't we try something else first? You know, maybe just well, um, we move the desk away from everyone else. Sometimes little things like that just make a world of difference. That's And that's a definite <coughs> issue today is we took him off the medication. He was off the medication at the beginning of this year, but the teacher said that he was being a problem and that he needed to go back on the medication. And so the doctor and his mom put him back on the medication. Well, the problem was he was overactive. Yeah, he was he was talking in class, and instead of m- moving him or doing some things, he suggested that he needed. It was either putting him back on the medication or putting him in special education. And he's a very bright boy. Like he can draw and he can write. He writes a short story when he's eight on the computer. Um, he's he's just really very talented. But once I, 
I also f- found out that if I'm honest with him and I tell him the truth about how things work, you know, if you don't show them that you're smart, then they're never going to know that you're smart. And so since I've been talking to him about that, he's being more active, proactive in class and stuff, so that helps. There is a trend in the society now to take things that are behavioral and they say it is a disease that needs medication. For some reason, I mean, some behaviors that are kind of shifting from a behavioral stuff, behavioral thing, to, oh, uh, that's a disease. You have to take a medicine for that. How true is this about ADD and ADHD and all this stuff? Because I have another question that I want you to verify for me. Just help me with that. <laughs> I think there are, I, I, I really think that there are probably some children who probably do need the medication. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, there's all sorts of different things in the world and I can say that, you know, with like stuff like post-traumatic stress disorder or OCD or ADHD or ADD, there are actual like behavioral strategies that you could use instead of medication to help move these things along. Um, there's, there's people who are eating crazy things because they just can't stop themselves. Um, it, there's, but there's actual psychology that you can use instead of a drug. I'm going to use it, um, an example very loosely here. Some parents are busy, so they just put any video tape for the children just to get rid of them and f- concentrate on their work. So could it be that <laughs> whoever s- the teacher or the parents or whatever give him a medication to... to that is true. That happens a So lot. it's really our... Pro- it's the, uh, w- we are the problem, not the children. I actually wrote it in my paper that, you know, that you... Uh, people as parents should be educated when they're having the baby, before they have the baby, like have to take a mandatory education on you know what parenting is. <laughs> I mean, y- you are you are touching on a very important thing. No, nobody studies what marriage is yeah. to start with, and they just jump in and have more problems or many problems. I will say that you know my 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 older son, my fourteen year old, who is very 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 smart. He at one year old could go and put a DVD in the thing and put it in and watch a movie until I woke up at five. Like he'd get up at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Um, but we had educational stuff. I mean, like, his video games was, like, the Wii Smile, and we had, like, you know, things that would make their brain work instead of let's shoot them up, kill them up, and <coughs> I think it depends on the technology you're and the actual game you're using and at what age you're doing it. Minecraft. Like, Minecraft. Two. Two. Uh, two. <laughs> my kids. It's like a drug. Xbox. It's like cocaine or heroin. <laughs> What's that? Minecraft. I have a nephew. He's eight year. Old. He's probably playing it right now, oh, yeah. because it's so it's so it's such an addictive game. My son's fourteen. I have a fourteen year old son who plays this game. I have a ten year old daughter who plays this game, and I have an eight year old son that plays. As soon as one of you guys said t- talked about the video games about focusing on achieving a thing and then getting a reward, I was like, Jesus Christ, I like Minecraft. <laughs> My eight year old son's actual birthday party was a Minecraft party. Well, like two, <laughs> two, 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 two quick, two quick <laughs> questions. First, what's the difference between ADE and ADHD? Uh, uh, sorry, AD, it, ADD and ADHD. ADD is just the uh, attention deficit. Uh, they can't, they can't pay attention uh, very well. ADD. Yeah, and then ADHD is where they can't pay attention very well, but they're always like on the go and they're always hyper. How would you say about there is nobody is absent? It's uh, they are, are uh, present somewhere else. If they are absent from you and you think that they are here, they are somewhere else. So it's the medication is not to do something to them, but to see where where their mind is going there, and do your homework as a p- doctor or physician or parent or teacher or something. Well, if the medication is not used right, if the medication is not used right, it can make you daydream. It can make you go. It's it's a side effect of to daydream. And if, if you're giving it to somebody who doesn't need it, then you are hurting them. those are the side effects. That's why you see all these 
house moms taking Ritalin because they don't need it. It's something, it gives them something completely different than it would give somebody who has ADHD. Two weeks ago, I received an email, didn't get a chance to verify it. So please verify it. They say that the physician, the scientist who invented or started the ADD movement or ADHD movement and all the medication before he died, I wish he's still alive, but he died. That's what I read in the email. He confessed that he made all this up, and it's, there's nothing like ADD, there's nothing called ADHD, and he has some, cor some relations with medication or drug companies, pharmaceutical. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, and it's a big billion dollar thing. With the frenzy of everything is disease, everything has needs a medicine. Now, I cannot confirm or deny, I'm just telling you the email that came to me. Is it a conspiracy theory? Is it this? I don't know. So please verify it. Right. One, just one last point. Some of the medications are effective. You know, I mean, it's not, I don't think if you give a kid a medication for one of the d diseases uh, and it allows the, the child to focus or it improves the behavior, I don't think that should be frowned upon necessarily. I, don't I mean, think we, we are chemical, electrical creatures, amazingly. Uh, so if you put some chemistry in me or some electrical, I'll react some ho somehow but I'm affecting some other stuff, so how much to, de to do, I mean, it's a big thing, yes. I know, um, you know, kind of along the lines of what, you know, you were saying and what Brandy was saying that, you know, it's not necessarily that giving a medication like Ritalin or, you know, some of the others is bad, you know, if it's necessary. And I have seen, you know, cases where, because I've worked at CTF, I've worked at DFI, I've worked with children in schools who have, you know, ADHD and all sorts of other, you know, things. And, you know, I understand that, you know, some of these medicines do actually work and help curve, you know, some of the loss of attention or some of the, you know, jitteriness or the, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and the, the thousand and one thoughts going on up here while they're supposed to be here, you know, at this one point. But for some kids, it's, they have what I call the NAW um, HD, and that's just need a whooping, uh, hyperactive, you know what I mean? Because some kids, it's just a matter of discipline and or, and or, you know, behavior, as I call it, behavior modification. So like what Brandy was saying, you know, making sure that there's a set schedule, making sure that the kid is allowed to, yeah, do the fun things they want to do, video games and whatnot, but they're also, you know, they're made to focus on their academics, they're made to do this, and it, it just takes a parent putting their foot down or a teacher putting their foot down and providing structure along with that fun and that extra stuff that they want to do. So sometimes it's not always ADHD, sometimes it's just, you know behavior modification as I call it. Well they uh, they say too that one doesn't cause the other but um, children that suffer from ADHD can also suffer from other disorders too. They're more likely than other children to suffer from other disorders like oppositional defiant disorder, bipolar disorder, things like that so they could also be suffer. you know. I think medication is better when it's like the the older kid type frame. I don't think that giving it, I'm not, I'm not for giving it to an eight-year-old boy. I'm not for giving it to anybody under the age of like 14, 15, even, actually I would prefer that they be an adult to be honest because adults do suffer from it. Um, so I guess my problem is is I, I don't like the medication because I've seen what it does to him and I personally am in agreement that you know there has to be a disciplinary we don't advise you to stop this because, I mean, uh, it's, it's a matter of thinking. Uh, what a group of thinkers you are, people. So <laughs> just give it a thought. Don't stop medication. Oh, no, I, my <laughs> husband and my husband's ex-wife, I just have an opinion. <laughs> well, please give them a hand. Okay, uh, good evening, class. Uh, I'm Manish. Uh, I'm Malika. My name is Ramya. I'm Avinash. Okay, uh, before I start uh, my presentation topic, um, I want to ask you one question. Mm, how many of you guys here use iPhone? Can you please raise your hand? Okay, uh, it's uh, good news for the Apple user. Um, today my presentation topic is on iWatch. So. It's good for iPhone users, so it's a, uh, okay, I'll go, uh, first I'll just go through this agenda, this is my agenda, 
Okay, this is iWatch. Okay, um, iWatch is an Apple first wearable gadget. Um, it's a smartphone that you can wear in your wrist. It's compatible with uh, iPhone 5 and greater version. And uh, this is the design of iWatch. So everyone's style is different as everyone's wrist. So Apple Watch comes with two case size. So one is 38 millimeter height and next one is 42 millimeter height. Okay, so there are two types of design. So they have uh, two resolutions. So first one is 272 into 340. So a uh, resolution, it describes the mm, clarity of the image. So the more you have the resolution, the clearer the image will be. So, um, and then the screen is surrounded by uh, stainless steel and aluminum. Okay, uh, this is. Uh, now coming to the premium looks, we are having six types on this. First is a stain, uh, stainless steel, second is a silver aluminum, and the third is a 18 carat yellow gold, and the fourth comes a space black, and the space gray, and the 18 carat rose gold. So these are the designs of the iWatch. And next, the processor here, we, are, we will be using the processor that is a S1. And this, we will call it as a system in package because, because all the, uh, what I mean, storage, connectivity and the sensors, e uh, input and output will be in a package, means in a single chip. So we will call it as a system in package. And next about the sensors. Uh, sensors will be um, uh, will be uh, at the back of the dial. <coughs> means that is a um, you know dial, right? Of the watch. So these uh, sensors uh, are the super du durable sapphire lenses, which uses the infrared visible light LEDs and the photodiodes to. Uh, I mean, uh, with this we can we can we can read the heart rate means what the heart rate of of ours, and next uh, using this accelerometer we use the G GPS Wi-Fi in our iPhone to m measure our movements, uh, and also to have the data of your of our di daily activities at a place, and next, and now. Uh, I would like to explain about the digital crown which presents uh, in the right side of the dial and this digital, the, that round thing is called uh, digital crown and this thing is used uh, to turn to turn movement into data and I which contains uh, sensors and also it this thing is used to scroll, zoom and navigate. Uh, for example, if you want to uh, see a message from our friend, we can scroll this route, round thing, uh, digital crown, to view the messages. And if you want to uh, zoom out uh, zoom out or zoom in the images, we can use this thing. And also, this thing is used for navigation. And uh, the, uh, the button, which is, uh, uh, which is down, which is there uh, besides the digital crown is called conversation button, and this button is used for used to start a conver uh, conversation with friends. And now Avinash will continue. And uh, the technology, uh, as my friend mentioned, that uh, Apple Apple's new S1 processor is uh, uh, S1 processor is advertised as a entire computer architecture on a single chip and uh, it's it uses a linear ac uh, linear actuator called a taptic engine uh, which is uh, to provide taptic feedback uh, to the alert uh, to alert or give a notification uh, when when it is received haptic feedback is a technology which uh, recreates the sense of touch or vibration or, or motions to the users and uh, uh, what uh, thi this iWatch is equip equipped with the 
uh, built-in heart rate sensor which uh, uses both infrared and visible light led and uh, photodiodes and uh, it's it is compatible with all uh, apple devices uh, like iphones uh, ipads uh, ipods and uh, including mac so uh, it's only uh, like it only it, it is only capable to connect with the uh, ios devi uh, devices which are uh, which uh, which are higher or equal to ios 8 which is the software used for to for the functioning of the iwatch and uh, it has a uh, it's a battery it has a battery power of uh, 400 uh, milliamps per hour but uh, the apple company is uh, still trying to work out on that as it is a very low power for a watch to function and according to tim cook uh, uh, it is this it uh, the iwatch is uh, designed to be worn all day and uh, uh, it's, it's a simple to charge at night. Uh, you may have seen it, the launch of it. And uh, it's uh, been releasing on spring, uh, like, and the price is like 349 And uh, we have a video about iPhone, iWatch. And uh, the conclusion is, uh, it uh, helps us to, like, uh, uh, it helps us to connect with uh, your uh, mobile, uh, like, uh, you can, uh, you, there is no need for you to pick up your phone or do like uh, use your phone in the middle of your work. So it just gives the notification e when e if you get a message, uh, like uh, you if you get a call, and uh, if you get a where it is, just it gives us a, a notification by a sense of vibration. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the hap uh, haptic feedback. It's like uh, when uh, two people uh, like using iWatch. If they want to communicate, they can communicate. Uh, like there is an option, as I said, haptic feedback. Like uh, you need to you uh, uh, use that. Uh, go to the uh, like there are uh, it, it shows your contacts like who are using i i, I watches. So uh, when uh, you try to contact a person who is using i watch, just you need to open his contact and uh, like you need to tap on the uh, dial. So and the other person uh, whom we are trying to contact uh, gets a feedback with a sense of vibration. And uh, so uh, like uh, if when he responds with the same tag, uh, 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 taptic feedback, and we can come like, it's a sense of communication. That's it. iWatch is, uh, you know, is near your body all the time, and um, does it have any side effects on your body? No, you it won't have. Like it's just as a watch, but uh, it uses uh, like uh, it uses the ca it connects with your phone and uses the uh, like internet, uh, like the internet, and it gives out the like it's uh, like uh, the response. But uh, you can get each and everything without using your phone. It, as it is connected with it, so you get all the information. Like you use most of the time, uh, we each and uh, you we take out uh, our phone from the pocket, right? Mm. So whatever the notifications we get, uh, we can see it on just on the wish list. And uh, there is an uh, it has a navigation option too. So when we are we travel, so we can just uh, check it with the and like. It has a facility. It has many facilities. You might have seen at the launch. Okay. Any other questions? I watch. You may or may not have this answer, but how does this product differentiate itself from Samsung's Galaxy Watch? Uh, like the. Okay. Um, uh, we don't know the answer exactly, but but as a like as an iPhone user, so. Pretty much, um, you'll you'll be like familiar with mm, iWatch, right? The operating system, main thing. So you are familiar with the OS and everything. So for you for you to um, like uh, go through the software, it will be more easier. So other questions? It's it's not out yet, right? 
It's uh, the product. 2015. Are they expecting a, a large demand for the product? Yeah, yeah. It has been launched, but uh, it has been launched, but there is still going to be some issues like bandwidth. And they s they expect that there will be a lot of people come 2015 that will have eye watches on their wrists, right? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. Very good. Thank you very much. Give him a hand. Now, last but not least. Picture, yes. <laughs> Are we good? Okay. My name is Bill Ryan, and I'll be talking about data privacy. I'll be defining it. My name is Janice Mitchell, and I will be talking about internet privacy legislation. My name is Fatima Khastroda Ardekani, and uh, I'm going to talk about NSA and data brokers. And my name is Michael Davison, and I'll be summarizing everything and talking about future projections in data privacy. Okay. So the first thing we have to do when talking about data privacy is define it. What is data privacy? Well, the first thing I decided to do was go to the dictionary and, do, and combine the terms data and privacy. <coughs> there we see or we, we come, with a combined de come up with a combined definition of the state or condition of having your computed character, symbols, or quantities that are stored or transmitted in the form of electrical signals or recorded on magnetic optical or mechanical recording devices free from observation or being distributed by others or having made public those electronic tr uh, signals or stored data which was intended to remain private. That's a pretty comprehensive definition, but when you're talking about data privacy and the minutia of sending and receiving digital transmissions, uh, it leaves it a lot open. It leaves a lot open for interpretation. So after that, I went ahead and uh, went to a, a modern taxonomy or classification system of privacy developed by Daniel Solov. Uh, this, uh, this taxonomy is a new way to think about privacy and it it, it breaks pri the, the categorization of privacy down into four categories with 16 subcategories. I'm only going to discuss some of the, the subcategories here. Uh, the first category is information collection. One of the subcategories is surveillance. And when you're talking about digital technology, you have to talk about surveillance because, uh, it is, because it's such a prevalent uh, issue dealing with governments and corporations. Surveillance is a negative type of privacy violation where a person or people are watched or monitored by a government or other powerful organizations such as Google, Facebook, Amazon. Uh, surveillance has to create a chilling effect in society where behavior of, of the surveilled is noticeably changed out of fear or anxiety. The chilling effect is where uh, people e feel they might be getting watched and they change their behaviors they, they, they'll change the, the websites that they go to, uh, to pre just, just based on the assumption that they think they might be getting watched. And this is a problem. Obviously, interrogation is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, this is the acquisition of information through coercion, but not, not really applicable to the Internet. Aggregation is a big one. Uh, it, uh, aggregation has the potential to be harmful. Aggregation is the pulling together of many different pieces of data into one central location. The issue here is that small harmless pieces of personal information, when considered on its own, can be quite meaningless. So just your birth date, just your address, just your grades, just your, your friend set or subset of your friends are all harmless. But the same meaningless data, when aggregated, pulled together, can create a comprehensive picture of who you are. Based off of a comprehensive picture, you know, governments or corporations can begin to uh, develop predictive models to, to try to understand what you might do next or to just try to understand who you are or the kind of habits that you have. <coughs> the other subcategories there are identification, uh, insecurity, and secondary use and exclusion. Secondary use is also, uh, will be covered later on, so I want to define it here. And secondary use is defined as the use of data uh, for a purpose not related to the one the data subject agreed to share for. 
So an example of, of this is you give Facebook or Google your information uh, to search uh, a product or to post a status. They take that information from you and from or, they'll aggregate it uh, with five million other people and then they'll sell it to uh, an advertising agency. This is this, the selling of that, uh, of that initial information to that advertising inf uh, agency is, would be secondary use of your information. Uh, exclusion. Exclusion is the failure to provide individuals with uh, notice and input about their records. An example of this would be if uh, a website creates a dossier, uh, which is a collection of documents about a particular person, <coughs> Uh, and uses it to rate you for a loan or some other application. In this event, you have no control over the dossier or your rating. Now, an example of something that you, an example of this, of, of a dossier where you're not excluded would be like your credit report. Your credit report gives you an, uh, the ability to, uh, to, 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 uh, make changes to it, to view it. A lot of times these are created uh, within uh, behind the curtain of a corporate uh, uh, a corporation and they don't have to show you anything. So if you, you might develop a negative uh, image uh, that, that might increase your interest rate credit card or might decline you for a loan and some of the information that went into uh, this uh, dossier may not be correct and you don't know because you can't see it. So that, again, is a, is a privacy problem. The next category is dissemination of information. Uh, breach of confidentiality. Uh, this is uh, very common when you go to the doctor. We all work under, there are laws to prevent the doctor sharing your information, but we all work under the assumption of uh, HIPAA in the United States where you can't, the uh, health professionals cannot divulge the information you give them. Uh, disclosure. Disclosure is similar to a breach of confidentiality, except the confidentiality standard might uh, never have been set. Instead of trust being broken, reputation is damaged. Both are harmful privacy violations. Uh, exposure is, a, is similar to disclosure and breach of confidentiality, uh, except that exposure often creates embarrassment and humiliation, grief, suffering, trauma, uh, injury, nudity, sex, urination, defecation, all involve primal aspects of our lives that we've been socialized into concealing. You know, nudity, and if, if I were to go to the rec center naked, I, I, I would be kicked out and arrested. 200 years ago, it was commonplace for Romans to go to the gymnasium and exercise in the nude. That doesn't mean because the Romans did it that we should be accepted, you know, that that would be a, a, an accepted uh, privacy standard here. We, we, privacy is a very kind of culturally relative uh, concept. <coughs> so also under this category of dissemination of information, we have blackmail, appropriation, distortion, and increased accessibility. Invasion, uh, intrusion, and decisional interference are the subcategories under invasion. The last uh, thing I want to talk about when we're, when we're discussing digital privacy is to, I, I think it's important to take this concept off the table from the, from the start. The nothing to hide argument uh, is one that actually Daniel Solov wrote an entire book discussing this topic. Uh, he, uh, his take on it, or actually an example of it is, is this. Uh, like I said, I have nothing to hide. The majority of American people have nothing to hide. And those that have something to hide should be found out and get what they have coming to them. It's a very negative, uh, uh, it, 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 it ascribes negative aspects to the concept of privacy. So it assumes privacy, Solov's take on it is that it assumes privacy is a bad thing. Uh, he claims that. Uh, aggregation is completely written off with the nothing to hide argument because the, the nothing to hide argument it fo uh, too narrowly focuses the, uh, 
the concept of privacy. Solov explains that the most glaring problem with the nothing high argument is that it, it tacitly assumes that privacy is about hiding bad things. Uh, he explains that this is a myopic conception of privacy as secrecy instead of privacy as a complex set of ideas. Uh, here Solov falls back on his subgroup of aggregation. Aggregation is a privacy concept that is completely written off when one utters a phrase of, I have nothing to hide. By saying this, you are too e easily allowing disparate groups who possess your personal information to potentially collaborate uh, to form a cohesive picture of you, a privacy violating portrait. Um, Solov's main issue with the nothing to hide argument is that it focuses too narrowly on the conception of privacy and it wins by excluding consideration uh, of other problems often raised with the privacy related problems. So invasion of privacy, you say yes, but the law says no. So I'm gonna focus on state legislation. According to National Conference for State Legislature, at least 17 states require government websites or state portals to establish privacy policies and procedures or to incorporate machine readable privacy policies into their websites. Specifically, Illinois legislation, uh, oh. Um, number five of the ILCS 177 slash five states that a cookie means a set of computer data on instructions or instructions that are stored in a user's computer via website um, server for the purpose of gaining information about the user. ILCS 177 slash 10 states that State website agencies may not use permanent cookies or any other invasive tracking programs that monitor and track website viewing habits. However, a state website agency may use transactional cookies that facilitate business transactions. So in other words, they can't use things that are permanent, um, you know, in terms of your websites that you visited and viewed. Um, cookies or stored information they can't use that um, but they can use things that you've used to purchase so like um, if you go to ebay.com or you go to amazon.com or if you go to um, I don't know your favorite store.com and then you order something off those websites they can use that information um, against you or um, in other cases as they need ILCS 177-15, the Internet Privacy Task Force is, compri is comprised of 17 members total, which include two appointees from the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the House Minority Leader, the Senate President, and the Senate Minority Leader, and nine of those individuals are appointed from the governor. The task force examines technical and procedural changes that are necessary for maintaining the state's Um, computing environmental privacy. The task force will identify threats to privacy from browsers, search engines, web servers, internet service providers, and state agencies that make recommendations as needed. The task force will also make recommendations for the creation or installation of computer programs on state host computers um, that will disable cookies and other invasive programs. This, the task force will submit reports to the governor and the General Assembly by December 31st of each year. I'm going to talk a little bit about SOPA, um, which is a national um, piece of legislation. Uh, SOPA, uh, HR uh, 3261 112, is the Stop Online Piracy Act. Um, which was introduced on October 26, 2011, and sponsored by Lamar Smith, who is a Republican representative from Texas, um, 21st Congressional Dis District. Um, SOPA authorizes the Attorney General to seek a court order against a U.S. or foreign Internet site that is facilitating online piracy or the theft of copywritten materials. So I looked a little bit at um, some of the other laws pertaining to internet privacy, and I thought it'd be kind of neat to do a comparison of the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, so when I was looking at um, an article online about 
uh, the United States and their laws, and then I kind of flipped it and compared it to the United Kingdom and their laws on internet piracy and privacy, um, I found that the United States investigates in instances of online piracy, they issue court orders, and they issue imprisonment and hefty fines, whereas the United Kingdom investigates instances of online piracy, so they're similar in that aspect, however, they do not take any course of legal action, rather they send up to four educational letters to individuals who commit such acts, such as piracy. So some people think that this is um, more of a light, lighter approach to uh, disciplinary action um, regarding piracy, internet piracy, but that's the course of action um, that the government officials in the United Kingdom take versus the ones that um, the United States takes. I'm going to talk about NSA and data brokers uh, and see if they are good things or not, or you know, a blessing or a curse. NSA stands for National Security Agency, uh, and uh, its existence a bit, uh, could be traced back to um, in 1917, three weeks uh, after just uh, United States declared war in Germany and um, uh, the World War uh, f uh, the World War one World War one and in 1937 library there just uh, several years after the first time there were some librarians professional ones just um, they realized that their ex uh, they c their profession um, just uh, could be used in a kind of um, organization or something so d they just uh, started to run an association for information science and technology a s i s uh, and t they provided administration and communication for its various uh, divisions uh, and one of the divisions that they, they used uh, administration and communication was uh, uh, known as a special interest group or sig the current NSA and uh, <coughs> their mission, uh, uh, first, uh, uh, I should say that the National Security Agency uh, is a U.S. intelligence agency. Um, it is responsible for global monitoring, collection, decoding, translation, and analyze of, uh, analyzing the information that the users just uh, gave them uh, somehow. and. Um, analyzing the data for foreign intelligence and counterintelligence purposes. Uh, as you can see in the picture, you can see different layers that the two first is uh, the things that they are already oh, uh, capable of doing. Uh, they can uh, understand the person layer and they can understand the cyber, cyber um, uh, personal layers. And um, it means the contraction, uh, the kind of uh, interactions between the users and how they can use their cell phone and uh, computers. And uh, the last three is uh, their mission or their vision in future years. Uh, the first one that are they are actually working on that is the logical network layer, is, they, uh, is that they can understand how they, uh, the users are uh, you know, trying to communicate with each other through the network and um, the last, the uh, next one is the physical network, and the last one is geographical layer. So they are trying to, you know, control everything. Uh, the biggest center, uh, it's, uh, you know, a kind of watching center that they use is the Utah Center that is established in just uh, uh, 2013. It's a new one, and um, it is actually famous for uh, the first intelligence community comprehensive national cybersecurity initiative, or as you can see, ICCNCI. It is designed to support the intelligence community's effort uh, to monitor, uh, strengthen, and protect the nation. And the code name is uh, Bumble High. So, uh, as you can see, uh, whenever there are some technologies and you know changing, there are some people entering the market trying to help and y make money somehow help, of course. 
And so uh, this is the data brokers coming into this, this market, uh, trying to help different agencies um, and government and uh, maybe uh, consumer companies or something to uh, use uh, the user's data for them. Um, they just try in different ways like uh, surveys, uh, uh, internet games, or maybe shopping, even communications. They try to, you know, um, use the names that or save, save the names, home address, you know, purchase histories, or other sensitive information. They just, uh, and then try to sell it to NSA or other, um, other group of people for different, um, you know, in incentives. Here is the uh, very uh, informative video. If you were interested, you can watch it. And uh, here is another video. It's is, uh, that NSA spies on you, um, which I think we don't have time. And um, here is shortly, uh, is going to you know explain what, he, what is their incentive. The first is data brokers, uh, which is simply money. And the second is NSA, apparently security, but they might use this information in different projects. And um, here is the Verizon and how it can really use the information. They collect the information. Um, when, for example, you have the, uh, a smartphone and uh, you try to you know, um, uh, just surf the internet, your device send an HTTP request and uh, the Verizon injects an HTTP header and then the destination website receives HTTP request with injected header and um, you know and the website uh, direct the request to the advertising advertising has some deals with Verizon and this is how it works and uh, the relationship between US government and the NSA is like it's a joke but it's uh, Mr. Obama uh, talking to a kid and the kid says that that says you are spying on, uh, on us online and he's um, He's responding, he's not your dad. So, um, can you expect any online privacy with these all people trying to you know, use your information? Uh, here, Michael is going to talk about future and the goals. Okay, so this is fairly grim. Um, this is the future of your privacy or online privacy as well. So, does anybody recognize this reference? Orwell fans out there, no? Okay, 1984. Okay, so uh, Google is gonna continue to provide you services, but at a price. So Google's gonna come up with new algorithms that are going to track what you do, what you buy, who you're communicating with to better service you. They already maintain all of your data and they have metadata on you um, for you know the things you do on a consistent basis, but now they're saying we're going to use that data to better service you and we'll continue to provide you a great user experience um, for free, but obviously it's not free. It comes at the expense of your personal information. So eventually we'll create something like the Android that really is your slave or your servant and is going to predict what you need, when you need it, and just be your uh, personal assistant of sorts. Google very recently in, the U well, in Europe, they rejected 58% of people's requests to remain forgotten on the internet. So let's say that there's some defamatory content on the internet about you. Um, Google now becomes the arbiter of that content, at least in Europe, and they decide whether or not that information will be pulled um, from their server side, like as far as Google servers, servers accessing that information. So that actually totaled to 84,073 requests that were rejected by Google. Um, these could be things from like somebody was uh, you know, raped and there's information about that rape out there and they want that pulled. Google gets to decide whether or not that is pulled or not. Or it could be like, you know, the guy is, a, maybe he's a child molester and he wants to have that information pulled and then Google would be right in not pulling it. And there are apps that monitor your thoughts and you don't even know it right now. There's an app by Samaritan called Radar. And what that does is, um, let's say I have it It'll look at all my friends, so maybe it looks at Bill and Janice and Fatima, and it follows their feeds and like looks for keywords as to what they're saying, and it tells me 
well, Bill's really depressed today. He might be suicidal or something. You should go check on him. Um, so like you can kind of see that on the surface that sounds like a good idea, but what's really going on is they're invading their privacy and they don't even know because they're my friends and they're you know connected to me and that's how this whole thing works is you probably don't think that you're putting anything out there, but you're connected to somebody who's connected to somebody and that information is being disseminated or you know funneled back into these data brokers or to whoever these uh, you know developers are for these apps. So how can you maintain your privacy? Well, you can remain anonymous. One way to remain anon anonymous is with the Onion Router, the Tor browser, and I am in no way a proponent of this. This is just something that you could use, and what this does is it encrypts your browsing experience, and um, the reason it's called the Onion Router is because it uses many layers um, of encryption, much like an onion. Right now it uses three layers of encryption, and then it'll pass through different routers until it comes out the inside, um, like the very last machine in the daisy chain, and it obviously won't be your IP, it'll be that machine's IP. So it looks like this, you start with yourself, and then this is the Tor network, it goes through Tor nodes, then it comes out the other end as whatever this computer's IP is. And believe it or not, this system was created by uh, the US Navy, and they made it, and they're like, this is a great tool. How can we actually use this to you know, combat um, you know, terrorism or to help with people that are you know, rebelling against their government or repressive regime or something like that? Uh, they had to make this public to get more users involved in the network because if it was just the Navy using it, that's not enough machines. So they made it public. They released it to everybody so they could hide um, and allow you know, people that are trying to stand up against their oppressive regime to use this network effectively. So it wasn't created for the purpose of illegal activity. However, it gets a bad rep nowadays. Like if you talk about Tor, people are gonna think you're using it for nefarious reasons, like something like the Silk Road or um, KP or something like that. So it, it was created again by US intelligence agencies. There are speculated to be over three million Tor users right now. So to wrap things up, how important is privacy to you? Not just online, but your privacy in general. And what are you willing to do to protect it? What lengths will you go to? Will you use encrypted browsing? And these are my thoughts about the future of online privacy. Like Kanye, I just, I don't see one. I don't think there's a future. Quick question regarding the Tor thing. If something is going from point A, B, C, D, E, where, where is, it, is it really lost? Because you can track it back. You can, um, and if, when you read our paper, you'll see that we kind of touch on that a little bit more. Like they can decrypt encrypted data. And recently in Great Britain, they shut down this huge network of people that were using the Tor network to disseminate um, like drugs and stuff like that. And they were able to decrypt all the data. It's just really, really hard to do that. But it is possible to go back and trace it to the original place. But as developers see that, hey, they can decrypt, they'll just add more layers of encryption, and they can just keep the process going that way. Any other questions, comments? Very good. Let's give him another hand. Uh, yes, please. When you are trying to send the data using Tor network, uh, that like uh, no no one else can know the data except the sender and the receiver. The complete data, if anyone tries to encrypt the data, but the output like uh, it may be shown differently. Like if you if I send you a message like, "Hello, Dr. Wafik Wabi," the message output if anyone tries to uh, inter interrupt in the middle and uh, tries to uh, like uh, catch the data but uh, it won't be visible the same because i did my uh, undergraduation major project on tor network so i have an idea about that yeah they can we can most of the people can use for criminal activities but uh, the U.S. government started it for the naval uh, communication, 
but it is still developing still the and in future we may get uh, like uh, we may people may not uh, try uh, like and then there are lots of yeah yeah but uh, they are trying to do like uh, if anyone tries to decrypt the data uh, they are trying to avoid it but it's a future uh, we have still more to develop in that it's nearly impossible yeah impossible yeah if anyone tries to yeah if anyone tries to de decrypt it but they will get a wrong message regarding the date we could theoretically decrypt a probable government war yeah yeah that's probably really like signed up caliphate like signed yeah all i thought all that i thought was like this was somebody on the inside that probably leaked information and they're just saying that to like scare people to think that the tor network isn't as secure as what you know, people previously thought it was. Yeah, it's like uh, if I, if I try to send a message from like from US to India or any other country, the data is like uh, it uses IP address of several countries like uh, uh, like England, Africa. So it travels through different IPs, but the send sender is always hidden, and the receiver also doesn't like he won't know who is the sender. But he may like uh, as I said, I will send a message from US to India. The Indian receiver who is there, he may receive uh, like the if he try if he tries to catch up with the IP address, it may be from China or any other country. So it's totally hidden. Uh, quick question for you: When they say that Brazil is having some attempts to take the control of the internet from America, does this mean that uh, America will lose its dominance? Or I think I think uh, you might be able to answer this better than me. I don't know. I think what it means. As of, as of right now, um, uh, an overwhelming majority of internet traffic comes through U.S. backbones, you know, comes th or U.S. company servers. And with the NSA revelations, uh, countries, uh, especially Brazil, because it, it, it was uh, found out that the NSA was doing economic espionage against Petrobras, which is, I think, one of their bigger oil companies that supports their, their economy. So they wanted to... Um, uh, to, to reroute uh, the way their internet traffic goes, and they wanted to control uh, who, w where their, their, their internet traffic goes to from Brazil, to prevent it from being intercepted through U.S. servers. Is that? Thank you very much.